Hi, I'm Jay Cow from Launch Online. Um, I'm doing a talk today on Google Ads in 2020 and beyond. Uh, my talk today is designed to make sure you are making the most of your Google Ads performance. For those with ads accounts, it's designed to give you an overview on new features and tricks you should be taking advantage of. And for those of you who might not be at the coalface of managing ads, it's going to give you an insight into how the platform has changed over recent years and what potential there is to really get the most from search engine advertising. I hope that I don't bombard you too much with jargon, but it is hard when giving a practical talk not to use some of the acronyms. So if you have any questions as we go along, my lovely team will be manning the chat so they can answer questions on the fly, as well as saving some of the questions for Q&A at the end. Um, we're delighted to be one of the sponsors of this conference. So we do have a booth that you will find on the bottom left of the screen in the expo area. And after this session and the Q&As, we will be in there and you can virtually message us or join us in the booth. Before we kick things off and to make sure that you can definitely hear me OK, please, can you comment with your favorite after work tipple? so that we know what that the chat is definitely working and um, we can also get some inspiration for the lunch hour. So, firstly, uh, a bit about me and about Launch Online. I'm Jay Cowell, as I said, and I funded uh, Launch Online eight years ago. We help businesses make more money through Google Ads and Facebook Ads, and we're proud to be a Google Premier Partner. The key to what we do is not just to be the best at online advertising, but also to understand our clients' businesses and work as an extension of their team to achieve their goals. Our HQ is in Exeter, and we love being based in the Southwest. In fact, in lockdown, I've gone all Barbara and Tom, and now we've got chickens and rabbits, and they're keeping us very busy. Our team have been working flat out to support our clients over the last six months, some of which have been hit very hard. Um, we do work with a lot of travel clients, which is a tough industry to be in. Others have done very well and have been able to pivot their businesses um, to be online from a tile client who has done very well from our appetite for home improvement to an underwear specialist who is now using that same material to make face coverings. Our client relationships have strengthened over this period and we've even been able to introduce new services such as website experience studies, UX audits, so clients who can't transact um, at the moment can plan for the future and take this time to improve their websites. Here is an overview of the topics that we're going to cover today. It's not an exhaustive list, but there are these are some of the features that you need to know about and that can also make a positive difference to your ads performance. Um, I'm hoping that after this conference, you'll be able to access the slides. Um, if not, message me and I can send them to you because then you can refer back to them because some of them are a bit wordy to make sure that we explain in detail the new features within Google and they can act as also as a bit of a cheat sheet for your team. So before we get to the nitty gritty and everyone loves a GIF, um, there's been some breaking news um, that you probably have heard about, especially if you've got a Google Ads account, and I'm afraid it's not good news. Here is, I say a little summary, it's actually quite a long summary, but here is the gist of the digital service tax. Um, it, the government introduced this new tax on the revenues from social media, um, social media platforms, internet search engines, and online marketplaces like Google, Amazon, and Facebook. Um, and the tax is 2% in the UK. Well, on Tuesday last week, Google announced they would be passing these on to advertisers as of the 1st of November. At the moment, it appears as if Facebook isn't going to follow suit, but Amazon already has with their seller and fees in, um, increasing on the 1st of September. 
So the return on your advertising spend just got slightly worse. Um, it's even therefore more important to be managing your ads well. This 2% tax will be added to your advertising invoice at the end of each month. Um, so you won't see the cost within the interface, you just see it in the billing area. As we approach Q4, um, the busy period, Black Friday, Christmas, it's one of the most important times for online retailers. And it is particularly important to get your Google Ads campaigns updated, take advantage of some of the new features. Otherwise, your competitors might have a chance to get ahead. Google predicts that this Black Friday is going to be the biggest yet, as you can see from some of the numbers on the screen. Um, for instance, more than a third of UK shoppers who normally shop in store for Black Friday say they won't this year. And 61% of UK shoppers say the pandemic will affect how they shop for the holiday this year. It makes it hard for retailers to plan. Um, and it will be interesting to see how smart bidding um, it reacts during this time. But to me, this period is going to be who can respond most quickly? Can you be agile and have you prepared well? So the first of the features that we're going to talk about um, are responsive search ads. Um, and I think everyone will agree that when it comes to Google search results, the SERPs, there's the first acronym, um, your ad size does matter. And those taking up more of the first screen real estate are likely to get the click. So here is how you can get your click through rate up. Um, over the past few years, Google search texts, um, text ads have been changing. In 2016, text ads sh stopped showing on the right hand side of the screen altogether and became mobile first. The size of the ads were increased from one headline to two headlines of 30 characters and a description of 80 characters, which then in 2018 became an expanded text ad of three headlines, 30, 30, 30, and um, two descriptions of 90 characters, which is a 94% increase in ad size. Often you won't see that third headline, but it is always best practice to use it. It was interesting over this period, click-through rates increased significantly and the ads started to look even more like organic search results. Responsive search ads were introduced in beta in 2018 um, and came out of beta into mainstream last year. They are dynamic text ads and they give you the opportunity to put in 15 headlines and four descriptions. And Google will display up to three of those headlines and two of the descriptions in the ad it serves. Collectively, those headlines and descriptions can be arranged. So Google says in 43,680 in 43, different permutations, um, which means that the ad testing possibilities are nearly endless. Google will then automatically test different combinations of the headlines and descriptions and learn which combinations perform best. Over time, the RSAs, responsive search ads, will serve the best message to different searches depending on the keyword they search for, their device, what they've been browsing for in the past and other signals that the machine learning has picked up. And the breaking news is that in the last week, we have seen accounts which only have the opportunity to, to write RSAs and no ability to create expanded text ads. So this could be the start of expanded text ads, also known as ETAs being depreciated. Um, there are accounts that we manage that will benefit from this, especially those with a large number of ad groups. It makes it much quicker to create um, ads and, and have ad testing without you having to do the hard work. However, advertisers who need to tightly control their messaging will find this more difficult now. And um, pinning headlines is something they don't actually recommend. I'm going to, um, I'm going to touch on auto-created ads later in this talk, as this needs to be something that you need to be wary of. When I talk about auto-created ads, I mean where Google um, writes the ads for you. Um, and that's something that has also come to, um, into, the, into the interface. 
Here are some examples of how you create RSAs. Um, as I said, although you have the ability to pin the headlines, it's recommended that you don't um, in, in less absolutely necessary um, for brand or legal reasons, as it can impact performance and inhibit the testing. What is also interesting is that Search Engine Land reported that more than 50% of Google searches actually end without a click to other content through to the website. So it's more important than ever to make sure that your advert gets across the brand messaging and takes up as much space as possible because um, it is clear now that an impression can be influencing a sale rather than just a click. So um, this is an example of ads um, using the, the three headlines in two descriptions. So you can see there um, the, the Yorkshire holidays, you can see those three headlines. Um, they've also added recently the ability for dynamic location in search, insertion um, and count time, countdown timers in responsive search ads. Um, those work really well for if there's a sale ending or some sort of deadline, um, particularly good for Black Friday. So uh, responsive display ads, obviously used for the display network, very similar to, to responsive search ads, RSAs. Um, and they work with images as well as text. So for those who don't know, the Google, Google display ads can appear across over 3 million websites, over 650,000 apps, um, and across Google properties such as Gmail and YouTube. They can also be super annoying on news sites, but they do actually work really well for not only brand awareness, but also for direct response when used in com combination with remarketing audiences and a strong call to action. Um, and actually smart display campaigns is something I touch on later. With um, responsive display ads, you give a selection of images, headlines, and descriptions, and it will give a wide range of formatted ads to fit a variation of ad sizes on the display network. Although those with tight brand get guidelines might wince at some of the ads created, it is a huge benefit for small advertisers who struggled always in the past to create all the different ad sizes that we needed. Um, the, the banners, the, the, um, the MPUs, the skyscrapers, so it does make it easier to create effective display campaigns. Like RSAs, it's going to use machine learning to see which adverts and text are working better and optimize accordingly. And more breaking news is that they're rolling out different types of responsive ad layouts now using automated image enhancements and smart image cropping and text overlays. Um, there's some examples here. These layouts are designed to help you improve the performance and deliver more engaging ads, so says Google. They do look better and we do expect performance to improve too. Um, we recommend you use them in combination with smart display campaigns. Um, and um, our big tip is that actually in an ideal world, you would have responsive display ads as well as a group of, of assets that you in the most common sizes um, that are designed 100% on brand with a strong call to action, preferably in HTML5 because the motion works really well to catch the eye. However, it's not always possible, especially if you don't have an in-house designer. And if you, if you want to test a campaign, um, our RDAs are a really quick way to get started. Hmm. So uh, video ad builder, um, this is um, uh, something that um, is actually in beta at the moment. Um, it really is important that you do embrace video. I'm gonna say this repeatedly during the talk. Um, Google states that over 60% of, of shoppers say online videos have given them ideas or inspiration for their purchase. And adding video to responsive display ads can result in 5% more conversions at a similar cost per acquisition. So there's no question video is effective, underutilized, and more important than ever for standing out from the crowd. Um, 
the idea between behind the video ad builder is that it's going to make video ads even easier to create than before using your existing images and text assets. Um, I haven't used this myself yet as we prefer using an ex experienced video content agency, but I would imagine again, it's better for small advertisers who don't have a video production budget. Um, in fact, if you can commit enough spend, and it's not a huge amount of money, Google do have a dedicated team who can create video ads for you. And they have a very clear brief document you fill out. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about YouTube campaigns for action later, um, but you know, video does need to be part of your marketing strategy. Location extensions. Um, Google are trying to be hyper local, um, to be really useful for the user. And location extensions are really underutilized and frustrating if you don't use them correctly. Um, what we did find was that um, for small advertisers who aren't so good at using their Google My Business account, um, uh, it was hard to get them to link it to their Google Ads account. And so Google have listened to this feedback and have made it easier to find your business to, to link. It is really important that if you do have a location, you do have bricks and mortar, that you, you make sure that your Google Ads and your Google My Business accounts are linked up. Um, and, and we're going to talk now about why that's particularly important if you've got um, a, um, inventory in a, in a store, if you've got a shopping feed. Um, please do focus on your Google My Business. If you do have a location, it's free to use. You should be keeping it updated. Um, it's frustrating for a user if, if people get it wrong, if, if your telephone number is incorrect or your address is slightly out or your pin's not in the right place. So we're steaming through this. Local inventory options. I think that this is a really great feature. Um, customers want faster and faster delivery times and sometimes tomorrow is, is not soon enough. So Google have improved the location options and the local options so that you can show what stock you've got in, um, you've got in store and what type of fulfillment options you have. So you will be able to show that, um, that you can pick up that, you know, a store nearby um, has um, that product in stock, which you can see from this image on the screen now. Um, it's not just for the Argus's of this world. It can be used for local shops, garden centers. Um, you know, don't forget pre-COVID, bricks and mortar stores were over 80% of shopping sales, but we've moved to a new world now and it doesn't look like it's about to change quickly. So local retailers with bricks and mortar stores who do have the facility to buy online should be embracing this feature and showing shoppers nearby what they have in stock. Um, I really do help that we can help um, more stores in Devon uh, make this happen. Okay, whistling through uh, lead form extensions. Um, this is something, this is another type of ad format um, that is, is meant to be um, making things seamless for a user experience, particularly on a mobile. Um, those advertisers who need leads, so property company, maybe software trials, B2B, any sort of lead generation can take advantage of lead form extensions now. We're seeing this work really well for some of our property clients. People uh, um, down, you know, uh, um, inquiring about um, a viewing, um, for example. But it does rely on the user to be signed into their Google account, and um, and so we find it's particularly working well for users on Android. Um, basically, it's helping to reduce the time um, it takes to get a conversion, um, and it works really seamlessly on a mobile. Um, it's particularly good if you've got a website that is maybe slow to load um, or the website form is difficult to use on a mobile. So um, those in lead generation should be taking, taking um, a look at lead form extensions. Um, within the, the YouTube ads um, interface, you can also do YouTube ads um, that, um, that drive leads. Um, Google have come a long way with their YouTube advertising and their true view for action campaigns are really good at generating results, website traffic, conversions, rather than just um, traditional brand awareness. Um, that's really helped our small advertisers who do need their, to, to get tangible results from their advertising spend. 
Um, YouTube, don't forget, is is the second biggest search engine. Um, and um, and when you know when a user will see one of these ads in the YouTube interface. Instead of having to leave the YouTube app and go on to the website, they can complete the form there and then, just like with the with the previous slide. Um, there are some eligibility criteria. You've got to have spent a certain amount, have a good history of policy um, compliance, um, and be in an eligible vertical. So there there is you know there are some requirements, um, but um, and people do have to be signed into their accounts. Okay, so now we're moving on to management and optimization. Um, I, those of you who are using Google Ads day to day will have noticed the Opti score um, and account recommendations tab. Um, and you know, you're given your account is given a score based on a percentage, um, and it, it basically gives you you ideas on how to improve the performance of your campaigns. They'll prompt you to make changes to your bids, your budgets, um, your keywords, um, your products, for example, uh, giving you ad suggestions. It's definitely worth going in and looking at this on a very regular basis. Um, Google are really pushing this to help people manage their accounts um, and also to take advantage of, of machine learning. Um, for new accounts created, Google um, is in the future going to make this an auto apply. So you will be having to opt out for some of these things for just being auto applied to your account. That's kind of a, a, a well, it's um, not always ideal. Um, it's much better to have your eyes on what is being applied to your account. So it is important you go to the um, the to the account recommendations tabs to rec uh, regularly. Um, one of the things that we're noticing is the ad suggestions. Um, there are depending on on the account, there there are potentially ads that are created that perhaps aren't as good as as a person could write. Um, so be, keep an eye on that because what you don't want is for some of these ads to have been written without your sign off and put wild into the Google search results. Um, some of these get auto applied after 14 days. Um, they can be turned off within the interface. Um, there is a setting that um, you can ask the team later how you access, um, but it is something to keep an eye on. Um, average position, um, like most people, um, BBC is um, fear change, and this one was a biggie. We we all showed average position um, to all of our clients in our reports. It was part of the optimization process. Um, you know, we would work on increasing the average position without driving up the cost per click. That was that was how it was done. Well, this has all gone out of the window now and it was removed. Um, most people who are in using Google Ads every day know this, but um, for those who don't, it was sunsetted. That's the, the term they use. Um, most, uh, most advertisers have adapted well to this. And now we talk about impression share and top impression share. Um, it, it does make sense because position one for an ad could still be at the bottom of the page if Google wasn't showing ads at the top of the search results. It did take a bit of adapting, but um, for those of you who aren't going into the interface regularly, um, you need to start to get, get used to these terms, uh, impression share, top absolute impression share. Um, this, um, is a, this is a bit like average position. Last week, at the same time as announcing the, the digital service tax, um, Google also angered PPCs by announcing that they would be including, that they would be only including terms that were searched by a significant number of users in their search term reports. Now, I don't think most accounts probably ever had 100% visibility on search term reports, but they were the way that we would add negative keywords and refine a campaign and prevent unwanted clicks and therefore unwanted spend. Uh, Google have cited privacy as the reason for doing it. Um, what it means, though, is that you need to be hot on negative keyword lists right from the get go. And when you combine it with their constant expansion of what close variants are, 
um, i.e. how they can match your, your keywords. Um, it means that accounts are more likely to see spend increase on irrelevant traffic. However, on the flip side, with over, I think Google says 16% of search queries every day being brand new to Google. Perhaps we have been refining keyword lists too much. And in the age of audience marketing, perhaps we need to loosen our control over keywords a bit more. The jury's out. Um, there are stats out there, although goodness knows how they're quantifiable, that say, that say some search accounts will see visibility drop as much as 60%. Mobile speed score. So I'm always going on about video and I'm always going on about mobile. Um, more than half of web traffic is on a mobile. I mean, some accounts, it's more like 85%. Yet the average mobile web page still takes 15 seconds to load. Um, that stat is um, uh, um, changing all the time. But on, on you know, it is worth running the, the um, page speed test um, on your website and looking in Google Analytics at uh, what the actual page load time is like. Um, so um, uh, there is a tool within the Google Ads interface that will show you what the mobile speed score is. It is important that you look at this. Um, you know, I feel like a broken record going on about mobile page speed. But it's now within the ad interface, you can have a look at how each of your landing pages are performing and you must keep optimizing. This is what it looks like in the interface. Okay, so next up, audience targeting. Over the past few years, Google has really improved the audience targeting within Google Ads not just on the Google Display Network, but also on YouTube, shopping, search. It means you can optimize campaigns and drive more clicks from those who match your target audience. And there was a time where Facebook ads was at the epicenter of audience-based ads, but while Facebook has had to start removing audiences after the Cambridge Analytica debacle, Google have been adding them. I'm not going to go into all of the options, audience options here, but I urge you to make sure that you learn more about how audience targeting can make your ads work harder. Obviously, you need to be in compliance with GDPR. I'm sure you can speak to Stephen Scown about that. But um, you really do need to make sure that your remarketing audiences are built well, that you um, are building good custom intent audiences, which combines the keywords that people are searching for um, uh, on YouTube and, um, and adds them to, to your campaigns. Um, there's some great in-market audiences, people who look like they're interested in dogs, which I'm pretty sure is most of the UK at the moment, the amount of puppy pictures that are on my Facebook feed. Um, finally, in this section, we're covering the performance planner. Um, again, a bit like the recommendations tab, the performance um, planner is designed to predict performance based on spend outcomes. Um, I had to re-record this talk because as of yesterday, the performance planner is now expanded to shopping campaigns too. And we love a bit of breaking news at Digital Exeter. So I wanted to make sure it was in my talk. Um, the performance planner's forecasts are refreshed um, daily and are based on the last seven to 10 days. Um, they're adjusted for seasonality as well. Google does state that your forecast will take into account any impact of market changes during this time frame, um, and that they've updated their seasonal model to account for current market conditions. However, if you listen to any of the PPC town hall events during lockdown, I think that you would agree that most machine learning went out of the window for at least a few weeks. And those running Google Ads had to rely on a lot of manual intervention to prevent accounts going crazy um, and adapting very quickly to, to a change in users' behavior. This um, performance planner is something that Google is pushing really hard at the moment, and we are testing it where it's appropriate. And it can be very useful on some accounts but we suggest that you use it with your eyes open. Um, the trick is to keep going in every few weeks to plan the next following few weeks rather than too far ahead. That's what our top tip is.
Okay, so the next section covers campaign types. Um, we're going to look at some of the, the new campaign types or adapted campaign types. And as I mentioned earlier, 16%, um, I think it is, of all search queries are uh, calling to Google a new every day. And DSA campaigns, which are um, also known as dynamic search campaigns, um, are a really superb way of finding new keywords and loosening the targeting of the traditional search keyword campaigns, where you're being very particular with exact match about what keywords you want to be found for. Combined with a smart bidding strategy and perhaps even some audiences to refine it even further, you can really get some great results from dynamic search ads. Um, if there is one thing that you take away from today, it would be to learn more about how these can work for you and use them to increase your reach and probably improve your results. Certainly, um, I think we could probably count on one hand where it's not worked. Uh, almost, you know, 99% of the time they work extremely well. Um, the only time I have seen it fail is where the website was very poor and not well optimized for SEO. Um, and Google couldn't work out what the page was about. So therefore, if you can't work out what the page is about, these campaigns will fa fail. Um, so um, we actually find that the SEO teams use these campaigns to, for a bit of, of, of health check on their content and a bit of keyword mining. Um, and it can also be used as an ad group within a normal search campaign. Um, you do have to be careful, though, if you're syncing your Google Ads um, campaigns with Bing, because Bing don't support that um, if you're importing in. Um, I should say Microsoft Ads, not Bing, shouldn't I? and make sure your negatives are set at an ad group and not a campaign level, or certainly that you've adjusted your negatives to take into it into account. Um, on our whistle stop tour, we're now gonna go over to discovery ads. Uh, we've been on the beta for discovery ads for a while now, and we've been getting superb results, really low bounce rates, good conversions, a really low cost per acquisition. Um, discovery ads came out of beta and became available to everyone in April of this year. Um, they um, Discovery ads were announced at the same time as gallery ads, um, and they really showed Google wanted to embrace images and advertising formats. But Gallery ads actually never came out of beta, which was a shame because um, for some of our advertisers, they did very well. Um, although image extensions are being talked about, um, but if I told you about them, then I might have to kill you. So discovery ads show across Gmail, YouTube, and this the discovery feed, and they use intent signals to show the ads to, to those users showing powerful buying intent. Um, this is how Google describes it. With discovery ads, you can rely on Google's understanding of consumers' intent across our properties to engage these audiences as they scroll through their favorite Google feeds. No search queries needed. It's basically about inspiring, almost social-esque, um, perhaps even also trying to compete with Amazon. Um, there, there are carousel, carousel ad formats which have worked really well for storytelling. Um, and when we approach a discovery campaign, we look at it more as a social ads campaign. Um, we use it in conjunction with softer goals, like, um, like maybe entering customers' details, adding to cart, um, and that enables um, smart bidding to take over and, um, and gets the campaign working really well. Um, highly recommend discovery ads. So smart shopping and smart display are part of the, the machine learning um, new campaigns that Google have been rolling out. Um, it has Smart ha shopping has mixed reviews. I think that's normally, though, where um, they haven't been implemented as well as they could have been because we've had some really great performance from this new type of campaign. Um, it replaces display remarketing as well, and it enables you to show ads across all of the Google surfaces, including YouTube um, and, and Gmail. And it's driven by smart bidding based on the goals that you're tracking. You'll need to add a company logo and a couple of images to the campaign. Um, there's also a feature now to allow you to add a conversion value willing to pay for new customers 
Um, Google states that those who add the new customer acquisition goal saw a 188% increase in revenue from new customers. Um, uh, um, the absolute key though, and at the core of it, is your goal tracking and your remarketing tags must be set up properly with proper active parameters, variables like product ID, value, all being tracked. Um, it's really, really important. The amount of clients whose tracking is flawed, who need data hygiene checkups, um, are too many. And it means that machine learning um, is only as good as the data that you feed it. So you must work on that. Um, there's also a new layout that's come out for, for um, uh, smart shopping, the, the showcase um, shopping format. Um, and they're allowing videos within smart shopping campaigns now as well. Um, I'm not covering sm a smart display, but it works very similar. Um, it's just on the display network and, and can be used for new customer prospecting as well as remarketing. So um, beyond 2020, I mean, the aim of this talk was to remind you that Google Ads is constantly evolving and that you need not only to be optimizing what's in the account, but you need to stay up to date on new features and campaigns and clever ways of combining tools to get the best performance. No one is sure what the future is of Google Ads. Right now, my feed is full of people recommending Ecosia as a search engine and trying to end the Google monopoly because of the digital service tax. For me, while I'm a realist, I can also see the small businesses that we help and that have been benefiting from an advertising platform that reaches a global audience and works within their marketing budgets. So I'm still a Google Ads advocate. 2020 is the year everyone is rushing to fully embrace digital, a digital transformation that was always coming but that has been sped up. Big brands are switching budgets to Google, Facebook, and Amazon. So for SMEs, it's going to get more competitive. Therefore, you need to be smart and agile to compete. My top tip is that Google Ads is going to become more and more about machine learning and smart bidding. And if you want that to work for your business, then you need to give the machine the right information. You need to get your conversion tracking in order and build your audiences intelligently to make the most of your data. Um, the world of data-driven marketing, I believe there's a talk on that. Um, I've included mobile video on list as well because I see this as businesses slow to adapt. You've got to get with the program. Finally, voice search, um, that's been talked a lot about. Um, it's like the QR codes of 2020. But it, when it comes to ads, I think we have enough to think about for now without panicking about how that will change ads once more. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session now. So thank you very much, Penny, for um, asking some questions in the chat. Um, I went ahead and um, uh, added them in there. Um, we're all in the booth after this talk. Um, I still don't entirely know how the booth works, but I think you can join and have a chat with us or use the chat function there. Um, and the team will be there afterwards. Um, is there any other questions that people had? I mean, it's it was a bit of a whistle stop tour of all of, well, some of the new features that have come to Google Ads. Um, when we, when we adopt new accounts, we often see that people haven't been using enough ad types. They've not been using all of the different new features that have, have become available in the interface. And ultimately, with you know, ads now becoming 2% more expensive as of the 1st of November, um, it's a no-brainer to make sure that your campaigns are in the, in the best possible order that they can be. Um, so I really recommend that, um, that you, um, I, I'll, I'll share the slides um, either on SlideShare on my LinkedIn profile um, or on Twitter. Um, but um, it's really important that you go through all of the new features and that you make sure that you've got really healthy campaigns um, that are optimized as well as they could be and that you're going into the interface regularly. Um, are there any other questions? I mean, uh, I was interested by... Uh, um, by the chat, the, the SEO question, how you can use Google Ads for SEO purposes. And I am chairing 
um, moderating after lunch a session on this same track um, where we've got three SEO experts going to be talking. Um, I don't claim to be one of them, so I'll be asking questions of them um, to make sure that, um, that the audience finds out more about how they can make the most of it. Um, yeah, Ecosia. Um, Ecosia is a search engine that promises to plant trees for every search that you do. It's powered by Microsoft ads, um, so um, the Bing ads interface. Um, uh, so any advertising you see on there is run off Microsoft ads. Um, you know, the thing with Microsoft ads is it's it's not the easiest interface to use, but um, you can normally get a cheaper cost per click, um, and it captures a, a slightly different audience to um, to Google ads those using the, the um, Bing or, or Microsoft Edge as a search engine. Um, it, it, most of our advertisers, if they're running Google Ads, will also be running ads um, on, on, uh, the, uh, within Bing um, or Microsoft as well. Um, Penny, do you mean, would you be using one or the other uh, as in Google or, or Microsoft or Ecosia? I mean, it's just which search engine that you're choosing to use. We often see that um, B2B businesses, um, so people who have got, you know, office computers that um, are running off Microsoft Teams automatically use Microsoft Edge as their search engine without even knowing it. Um, I think that um, uh, depending on your settings, Safari, I think, comes preloaded using Bing. There is talk of an Apple search engine, and I think that would be a really interesting um, uh, change in, in, in 2020 if that happened. Any other questions? This is the awkward bit where I sit here by myself. <laughs> I'm here too, Joe, don't worry. <laughs> I think that's probably I've, a question. I've got a quick question if you'd like it. Yeah, go on, um, then. <laughs> So um, we do quite a lot of work with Google Ads as well um, and something that we've kind of uh, been keeping track of in maybe the last week or so, so it's quite a new development, um, is um, about, you know, where it shows you about new, uh, negative keywords um, and it's not going to show you as many of those anymore, only the ones which have been really highly searched. Um, how much impact do you think that will have on yeah, so there's there's been a lot of debate about that, um, and the slide that I talked about it's search term report. So that's how you how you have a look at what. Um, in fact, let me explain to those who might not know the difference between a keyword and a search term. So um, keywords are what you're bidding on within Google search ads. You would type in a, a um, you would bid on, for example, Caribbean holidays. And the search query, the search term that somebody puts into the Google search engine is actually what the search term is called. So if they put in, I want a, a Caribbean holiday, that could then trigger one of your ads because you've got the, the words Caribbean holiday as your keyword. Um, so we were able to trawl through all of the search term reports. It's part of our regular um, optimization activity and see what search queries have been triggering all of those ads. And then you start to see that there are negatives that you wouldn't have ordinarily thought about that you can, as you say, add to your negative keyword list and start to refine and shape the campaign. Google limiting that information does seem a real kick in the teeth because you are paying to advertise. And it's, it does almost seem like, you know, they're taking, they're taking um, more control away um, when um, at a time where actually they're doing that on all fronts. And this was one piece of control that was actually really good to have. If you're running a B2B account and your average cost per click is maybe nine or 10 pounds, that's a lot of wasted money, especially if you've got very tight keywords and, and you really want to see, you know, kind of what strange, unusual misspellings. Yeah. The other problem is that they've been loosening what uh, I, I mentioned, close variants. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for those that don't know what a close variant is, if you've got exact match car wash, for example, um, Google will then um, uh, allow words that are similar to car wash to be shown, even though you're not bidding on, you're bidding on the exact words car wash. And you'll see within the search term reports, it comes up as exact match close variant. And they're loosening that more and more. So yes, I, I do think it will cost advertisers more. 
But overall, in most of our accounts, cost per clicks are down, mm. probably because there's a lot of competitors that have come out of the um, the marketplace because of um, because of COVID. Um, so um, uh, most of our clients are actually spending less and getting more this year. Um, perhaps it's just another way for Google to make more money. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Becky Becky was able to answer um, the question that John asked. Hi, John, um, about DuckDuckGo. Um, so, yeah, it uses um, the, the Bing ad networks. One of the reasons that people like using DuckDuckGo because it, it doesn't hold data. It's a search engine that doesn't hold data on you. Um, and in this world of data privacy, I mean, I've not even covered the the changes to, um, uh, to Safari and, and Apple's um, use of cookies and what a difference that that's going to make to tracking um you know we might be moving into a, a world where we where remarketing and and cookie tracking goes out the window in which case um that's going to be really hard to show a return on investment um so yeah we'll have to see i debate that often with um with ben at, at stephen scan <laughs> it's also interesting though right because it changes all the time <laughs> always new things to learn <laughs> definitely definitely <laughs> um all right then um i think we will leave that there so the main stages uh, just finished their session as well um so yeah like you said jay any other questions you'll be in the booth um and your session is uh later at one forty-five for the panel as well yeah that's right, brilliant then. thank you very Thanks, much Becky. cheers all right bye-bye